fellow peacemaker, welcome back to episode 14 of Make Peace Not Beef. I'm your host, Lily. And today joining me is the CEO of Exequest, John Lin. John is passionate about reversing climate change and his company is embarking on a grand mission to develop the technology and infrastructure to store enormous amounts of CO2. John's also got a very interesting career trajectory leading up to his climate mission that he will tell us about later. Today, we'll be talking about carbon capture and storage which is a critical technology in reversing climate change. And John will be here to guide us through the conversation. I'm so glad to have you here, John. And I'm going to hand over the mic to you to let you introduce yourself. Thanks so much, Lily, for having me on. I should throw a shout out to Work on Climate. That's how we met. And where would I begin with myself? I'm 39 years old. I uh, live in San Francisco. And I've been in school for too long, I would say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> First went to college at a place called Drew University in 1998, studied economics. And after that, I went to law school at the University of Pennsylvania. I did spend some time working as a lawyer. And then I had this epiphany in 2011 that I should change what I'm doing while I was still young enough to do it. And so I went back to the City College of New York to study chemical engineering. And that lasted until about 2015. And then I went to Stanford and I was in the PhD program there until 2019. And I decided, I think I'd had enough. I didn't really need a PhD. And I was pretty happy with the master's degree and I was ready to start this Exequest uh, nonprofit. Oh my gosh, wait, let me just recap that. So you went to get a bachelor's in economics, then you went to law school, then you went back to school to get another bachelor's in chemical engineering, then you went to grad school. That's right. So that's four different degrees. So 15 years yeah, after high school, in school. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, the last eight of those were pretty fun. That was me going because I wanted to go back. No, that's fantastic. You're like the most qualified entrepreneur. <laughs> so wait, why did you go back to school to pursue a second degree in chemical engineering? Was, was it around that time that you became climate concerned? It was. I mean, I reached a point in my legal career where I was done with law for a while. I was going to take a break. And I did want to get involved in working on climate and energy issues. But I realized that my background was economics and law. So what did I know about where to get started? So it was really filling the knowledge gap to get involved. And I was young enough to do it. I was married, but we didn't have kids yet. And I had a pile of cash from working at a law firm. So I was like, why not? Let's, let's do it. Absolutely. And listeners, we're going to dive into John's personal journey and his career near the end of this episode. So be sure to stick around. First, let me ask you two questions that will allow the listeners to better get to know you. So what's your favorite plant-based dish, would you say? Okay. So I know you're vegan. I'm personally not vegan, but I do eat pretty vegetarian these days. My wife is Chinese, so she's really gotten me into this um, Sichuanese flavor. If any of your yeah. listeners are from China, they may know a sauce called lao gamma. I, I can't have lao gamma in the house because I'll eat the whole bottle. If you make a dish with that, you know, some kind of Sichuanese veggie stir fry, that is like awesome stuff. Wow, that is a bomb answer. So I actually have lao gamma at home. My mom also makes her own chili oil because we're real Chinese. It's, it's so addicting. It's for listeners who don't know what it is, uh, lao gamma is a black bean chili oil sauce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's hard to do it justice because it really combines the flavor from the oil I think they call it like numbing, spicy flavor. Yeah. And then it's salty. Nothing to dislike about it. <laughs> yeah, you can drip it on anything like dumplings, rice. It's, nice. it's totally delicious. Wow. What about, uh, okay, tell us about your hidden talent. Oh, so this one's reaching back quite a ways. So when I was in law school, my friends were like, hey, John, you should just work out some more. So they got me to join the boxing club. And I was like, okay, this seems fun. So we had a trainer who came in. He had a gym in Philadelphia. I, was, I went to law school in Philadelphia. And he came to the law school and had us hit the bags and do drills. And then at the end of the year, the law school gets together with the Wharton School of Penn and they have a tournament where they match people up in fights. And so believe it or not, it's a place called the Blue Horizon in Philadelphia. And it is the place that is in the opening scene of Rocky One. So in the opening scene of Rocky One, Rocky is having a fight with some guy and it's in that very arena. And so the law school and the Wharton School at Penn, they rent out that arena every year. They have an event. And I got matched up with some like enormous dude from the Wharton School. I kind of, I guess I just went through with it because I didn't want to check it out. I was like, I didn't really sign up for this, but okay, if they want me to fight this guy, no problem. And my only goal was to really just not get myself hurt. And I ended up like beating the crap out of this guy. So it was a good time. Wow. And nowadays you've turned into this climate superhero. Now you're sort of <laughs> in a well, different arena, kind of. Yeah, it's, it's what I do. Someday I may have to go out and get a real job and make money like everybody else. But for the moment, my wife makes the money. I have 
a lot to take care of our daughter and I get to work on climate stuff on the side. Hey, this is the real job. I was talking to Cassandra and Eugene. They are the founders of Work on Climate, the organization mm -hmm. that John and I are from. And they were talking about how climate tech will be the fastest growing sector. We're on the bleeding <laughs> edge. This is the fun part. Literally on the bleeding edge. <laughs> Hopefully we won't bleed too much before we find a solution. But yes. Okay, let's get into our first topic of today, which is carbon capture and storage, critical technology in reversing climate change, as I've spoken about. So I'm going to let John talk about what carbon capture and storage is and why it is one of the key technologies to reversing climate change. Okay, so if I start sounding like a professor, you got to stop me. Right? <laughs> okay. I, I'm going to really try to make this not boring. But, but carbon capture and storage is exactly what it sounds like. Take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and store it somehow. Now, you use the terminology carbon capture and storage, and I would just caution your listeners, if they Google this, they're going to find this acronym CCS. That refers to actually something very specific, like CCS technology is taking the emissions from a power plant. So here we're talking about carbon capture much more broadly. Right, so, right. You know, it covers everything from trees, right? A tree, when it grows, is yeah. picking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And obviously the tree itself is made of carbon. So it's storing the carbon for a long period of time. It can also go all the way to a special machine that we're building. And there's a lot of activity going on right now. You're in Canada, so there's a famous Canadian company called Carbon Engineering that's doing this, where they've literally built a factory that, yeah. that is removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and then lots of science happens and then it gets stored. <laughs> so. Wait, so my question is how exactly do you remove carbon from the atmosphere when it is literally evenly distributed throughout the entire planet in small concentrations? It's extremely challenging. Direct air capture is the special word for what you're talking about. Taking CO2 directly from the air, we can definitely talk about that, but it's hard because the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is very low. It's mm -hmm. like 400 parts per million, or maybe 420 now. For us, it's very high, but in real terms, it's very low. For every million molecules of gas, only 400 of them are CO2. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. It is literally like looking for a needle in the haystack. So this gets me into, I'm going to show you a slide. <laughs> okay. This is just a graph and it's showing you over time, how has the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere changed? And obviously it's going up over time, which is concerning. This is really the heart of the problem. I guess <laughs> what's really shocking is that here, look at 1960 on the left-hand side, and we're at about 320 parts per million of CO2. If you go back to a thousand years ago, it was only like 280. It took us like a thousand years to go from 280 to 320. And then since 1960, we've gone all the way up almost to 420. So in about 60 years, we've increased the uh, concentration of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere by 100 parts per million, which is a lot. And some of you might have heard of an organization called 350.org, pretty famous, Bill McKibben's famous guy. Yep. The reason they called it 350.org was because when they founded that organization, they thought we need to get back to 350 parts per million of oh. CO2. That's going to be the safe concentration. So if you look at this graph, 350 is somewhere around 1990. So we've been increasing the concentration of CO2 for 30 years. In addition, we're about 70 parts per million higher than Bill McKibben's target. Unfortunately, nature doesn't remove CO2 from the atmosphere very quickly. So even if humans stopped emitting CO2 today, and um, maybe all the humans disappeared from the earth, and the earth just did its own thing, it would take a really long time to get back down to 280 parts per million. And that would take I think millions of years. I, mean, I don't know exactly how long, but it's not a quick process. And then the other problem is that I don't want to be negative for your listeners. I know we're all very optimistic climate people. When I meet people in the real world and we talk about climate change, it, usually it's not the top of their priority list. Those of us who are making life decisions about climate change, we're it's still very much in the minority. Your average person is just going to work, they drive, they take vacations, and, and climate change is something they'd like it to go away. They're not ready to change their lives over it. So I'm a little pessimistic that even with all of our best efforts, we're going to get to zero emissions anytime soon. In a world where that's not really changing very much, I think you have to start thinking about removing CO2 from the atmosphere. We all should do our best to reduce our CO2 emissions. We should all be vegans like you. And shame on me, right? I'm not a vegan. But I think maybe we just have to accept the fact that most people are going to want to live their lifestyles right. kind of the way they are now. Mm -hmm. And you've got people in the rest of the world, like Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, China, India, all these people want to improve the way they're living. They want to have cars and houses. And maybe we should try to make that as green as possible. 
but is it really right to say that somebody who's living at a lower standard of living today can't improve their standard of living? I'm not so sure about that. So to me, carbon capture and storage is a way of saying, not that we can necessarily have our cake and eat it too, but maybe we can have a little bit of cake and eat it too. And I'll tell you how bad the situation is. Like, I don't want to be too doom and gloom for your listeners, but there is even a technology beyond carbon capture and storage that people are talking about seriously these days, which is solar radiation management. This is the idea that we're going to put particles in the atmosphere that reflect the sunlight. But they're going to create a situation where we can never stop shooting those particles in the atmosphere because we haven't solved the CO2 problems. I keep my spirits up by actually trying to work on a solution, but I think you have to be realistic about how bad the situation is. So what John just spoke about right now, solar engineering, I actually covered it on episode four on my podcast, where I talked about how technologies can help mitigate climate change. So yes, this is really a last resort for humanity. This is not something we want to easily evoke, but there are people doing research on that. Actually, there's a Harvard professor who's a huge proponent of this. I'm not sure, was his name David Keith? That's right. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's the famous guy. <laughs> I know. He's garnered a lot of attention for doing research on that. But I'm more interested in what John's doing because John is taking a very different approach. He's saying you don't need all these new technologies to solve a problem that is plaguing all of us today. John, before we dive into your company, which I want to talk about, can you just give us a brief overview of all the carbon capture storage technologies that are out there? Yep. I'm going to go to another slide. Again, I promise this is not a lecture, but it helps if you have a visual aid here. So who doesn't bear miss with me. our college days? Yeah, let's get into That's it. That's right. It, it helps to have a picture, right? Um, Correct. So, I have to, and you see that? Uh, yes. Okay. So how do you remove CO2 from the atmosphere? And this slide gives you the basic idea uh, of what technologies are out there. It, it even includes the oceans too. So I am going to run through these very quickly. So coastal blue carbon, you got some pictures of like a plant here and some sea grasses, and that's pretty much what it is. It's plants that grow in water. And the hope is that some of that plant material gets down to the bottom. So say like in the dirt underneath the water and it gets buried there for a while. So it stores some carbon that way. You've got something called here, accelerated chemical weathering of rocks. And believe me, I was studying chemical engineering for years, and this is something I only heard about very recently. It's pretty interesting, actually. When there's a volcanic eruption and lava comes out of a volcano, that rock, because lava is really like melted rock, it actually is able to absorb CO2 over time. And it just becomes a rock with a different chemical formula, but it, it pulls CO2 in. So that process is normally very slow, but there are scientists who want to speed it up by taking some of this volcanic rock and grind it up into powder, and then it absorbs more CO2. So that's another idea. The big one that's out there right now is direct air CO2 capture. And it's this picture of a bunch of fans, and it's connected to an underground geologic formation. And that's literally what the technology is. I like to compare it to flypaper. So you got flypaper, super sticky, and flies stick to it. But if you want to remove the flies from the fly paper, it's a little trickier, right? Because they're already stuck on there. It's very similar with CO2 and some of these CO2 capture materials. So inside this box with a bunch of fans is something that's like fly paper for CO2. So CO2 will stick to it, but obviously you want to release the CO2 from it eventually. And the way you do that is by heating it up. So direct air capture of CO2 involves CO2 sticking to some material, heat it up, release the CO2, and collect it, and then you're going to shoot it underground into a geologic formation where people say it's going to last for thousands of years. It'll never leak out. We'll see. Now, there's a variation of this technology that involves biomass. So biomass, think of wood or straw or anything that could burn. You use it as a fuel. So the idea here is you take this biomass, you're going to burn it, you get some energy from it, and then, and then you're going to collect the CO2 that gets released when you burn it. And same idea with direct air capture. You're just going to like take your flypaper, remove the CO2 from the flypaper, and then stick it underground. Okay. And then I think at the end, we get to these other technologies, which are more about nature. So reforestation should grow trees, capture CO2. That's not complicated. Soil carbon is this idea that farmers can change the way they do their farming. So they can stop tilling up the soil, they can plant a cover crop, or they could put a lot of compost in their soil, and that will increase the amount of carbon in the soil. And that's legit too. 
And then the last one, biochar, this is where you take a bunch of biomass and you heat it up, but you're not burning it. You're doing it without oxygen. So it, it turns it into this black, like charcoal powder. And that's what biochar is. And people say that biochar can last for hundreds of years, thousands of years, and won't decompose. So it's a way of storing carbon. Okay, sorry for the lecture, folks. And I know <laughs> this is actually an exercise that I went through as a grad student about two or three years ago. I was sitting in grad school and I was literally wondering to myself, okay, we need to remove more CO2 from the atmosphere, but how do you do it? Read this report that I just showed you this picture from. And I was thinking to myself, okay, all these scientists say their technologies are so great, but how do you tell the difference between them? So I definitely went through this exercise where I was trying to figure out what is the difference between them and is there a way of saying that one is better than the other. So I'm not going to give you guys a lecture on this, it's not the point, but you want to think about the energy cost, right? So every one of these technologies that I showed you on the slide has some energy cost associated with it. And you say, okay, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because we get most of our energy from fossil fuels right now. So if you're going to run some technologies to capture CO2, but you use a ton of energy to do it, then you haven't really accomplished anything. You just kind of exactly. spent energy in another way and released the CO2 again. So you really have to worry about energy cost. And then another major issue you have to think about is permanence. So not every form of CO2 storage is equally permanent. So say at one end, you have a tree. So a tree takes 50 years or 100 years to grow, but eventually a tree will die. And the carbon that's in the wood will eventually decompose. The carbon returns to the atmosphere. So that form of storage is not permanent. Then you get into something maybe that you could consider rock solid. So accelerated weathering, for example. Basically, the process is going to make limestone. Like limestone is calcium carbonate. I'm sorry for the chemistry, but it's like a rock. Kind of so you're basically you can... trying to condense the CO2 back <clears throat> into a solid form, basically. That's right. Yeah, w w at least with the rock weathering. Mm. You're making limestone is pretty solid stuff. So that's super permanent. And then all the other technologies are in between. This idea you're going to shoot CO2 underground and it'll stay there forever. Maybe. I don't know. Some of these technologies might have some side effects that we're not so keen on. People who are working on direct air capture technologies say, we need 10 years of innovation and our technology will become amazing. It'll be like micro you know, chips in your computer. They got super fast, really quick. Everybody says that's going to happen. Is it really going to happen? Not so sure. What I would say about carbon capture and storage today is that it's pretty much the Wild West. Um, everybody's promising everything. Nobody has delivered anything. There's a quote from a famous physicist, Richard Feynman, that I like to use. And he said, for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. That quote comes from a famous report investigating a shuttle disaster. So in the United States, we had a space shuttle explosion in 1986, the Challenger explosion. And Richard Feynman was on the committee that reviewed that disaster and wrote a report about it. And, and that was his feeling about the way NASA handled its technological issues. They had allowed public relations to take over from reality. Thanks so much, John, for giving us an overview of carbon capture and storage. I know there's a variety of technologies out there and you've basically distill that information for us <laughs> very effectively. So now I want to talk about the carbon cycle because this is relevant for what your company deals with specifically. Mm -hmm. So can you please enlighten me and my listeners, first of all, what your company does and, and how you are trying to tackle climate change and what that process involves and how your solution differs from what's out there. Sure. So I want to start by talking a little bit about biomass, right? It's a term that I'm going to use a lot. So biomass includes plants, trees. It also includes things like paper towel or a piece of paper, cardboard, cotton. Most of if your clothes are made out of cotton, that's also coming from a plant. So all of these are materials that are coming from the process of photosynthesis. They're also materials that can decompose over time. It may not seem obvious to you, but if you take your cotton jacket or your paper products and you put them in a landfill, they do decompose back to CO2. And that is called the carbon cycle. So we got one more slide. I think this is going to be the last slide. <laughs> Let's go with it. <laughs> <clears throat> this reminds me of my high school days. I'm pretty sure we all learned this in high school, like science classes, but that's true. It's good to refresh our memory. Let's go. Okay. So you've got a pretty famous figure of the carbon cycle. In fact, it's the Wikipedia figure. So what are you seeing here? You're seeing 
photosynthesis. That's how plants and trees grow. And here it's saying it, they take in 120 gigatons of carbon per year. That's a lot, right? And if you convert that to CO2, that's about 450 gigatons of CO2 per year that's going through photosynthesis into plants. And then you see two arrows that kind of balance it. So you've got one plant respiration, and it's got a 60 next to it. And then the other says microbial respiration and decomposition. That has a 60 next to it. So 60 plus 60 is 120. Their cycle is roughly in balance. It's basically your carbon cycle, at least on land. Now your listeners are probably wondering like, what's well, plant respiration? Plant respiration is plants need their own energy to live and grow. So when they make food for themselves, they eat some of that food and CO2 comes out. So that's plant respiration. This other thing, microbial respiration and decomposition, that's when bugs and funguses and all other sort of organisms eat plants. And then they take energy from the plants and they release CO2. So those two together, those are your big fluxes. The one that ExaQuest thinks about is this microbial respiration and decomposition. 60, and you multiply that by about 3.67, that gets you to about 200 gigatons of CO2 per year. And that is the emissions that are happening worldwide from just things rotting. So you throw a banana peel in your garden, you bury it, that banana peel is gonna rot pretty quickly and all of the carbon in the banana peel will become CO2. So that's the process we're talking about here. Now compare that to human emissions. So here in this figure, it says fossil fuels, cement and land use change. Then they've got a nine next to that. And so now human emissions are about 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. The comparison is 200 gigatons of CO2 from things decomposing versus 40 gigatons of CO2 from humans doing all their industrial stuff and driving cars and flying planes and all that. So the realization I want people to take away is that there is a huge flux of carbon in the carbon cycle that's going on that you're not seeing, but you don't really notice it because the carbon cycle is in balance. So all the carbon that's coming in from, through photosynthesis is being balanced by the other fluxes. And don't feel bad about this. It, this never really occurred to you before because I was working on climate related technologies for three years at Stanford and nobody in my research group was ever talking about this. <laughs> John, I have a quick question though. So it, it seems like the CO2 from microbial and respiration and decomposition greatly outweigh the CO2 that comes from human emissions. Like that part is counterintuitive for me because I thought the reason why CO2 emissions have been rising so sharply in the past 30 years is because of human activity. But if human activity isn't even a huge part, like doesn't even contribute to the vast majority of emissions, then why is it that carbon levels have stayed relatively constant and only in recent years it's gone up? I think the best way to think about the distinction between human emissions and decomposition is that in the past, it was always in the background. Like you, you might uh, put down a bunch of wood chips in a park or you throw away your cardboard and your paper and this is just garbage. And, and people don't really think about what it becomes, but it, it's always been there. Even before we had products like wood chips and paper and cardboard and all that, there were plants that were growing and then dying and decomposing. And, and honestly, when I talk about this idea with a lot of people, they say, isn't decomposition just nature? And, and the answer is yes, it is nature. But it, it's a part of nature that I think we might want to intervene in a little bit because we have this bigger emissions problem from our own industrial activities. Do you think the increase in decomposition is also partially due to our increased consumption and production of goods overall? Like now we have more banana peels and more cardboard everywhere in the world. So there actually hasn't been an increase in decomposition. This carbon cycle has been the same for millions of years. What has changed in recent years is fossil fuel burning. So humans have burned a lot more fossil fuels. You make an interesting point. It may feel like we're producing a lot of things that can decompose, but remember that a cardboard box before it became a cardboard box was a tree. So <laughs> we put a lot of effort into taking a tree and you take it to a sawmill and a paper mill and you turn it into a cardboard box and it'll eventually decompose as a cardboard box. But if you never did that, the tree would eventually die and decompose. And, and so in that sense, like the products that we make from biomass, they're not really changing the decomposition flux, uh, not very much. Okay, so now we know a little bit about the problem basically. So how is ExaQuest trying to solve that problem? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the slide for just one more minute, just so I can make the point uh, with a little bit of text. Oops. Okay, this is the last slide of the presentation, unless Lily asks for one more, but I don't think she will. So we got this uh, figure on the right, which we just talked about. Carbon cycle is great. And a few points I wanna make about it. So point one, 
biomass is captured carbon. So when all this carbon goes in through photosynthesis and it gets converted into biomass, that's carbon capture. Just as much as a fancy machine that somebody builds or is rock technology that people want to use. Point two. Biomass that doesn't decompose is sequestered carbon. We're all worried about how do you sequester carbon? This decomposition process is something I think we should pay attention to because if we can take all the biomass that's being created naturally by plants and trees and just prevent it from decomposing, then we're sequestering carbon. And then the carbon cycle fluxes are huge. 450 gigatons of CO2 per year are going in and 200 of that gets re-emitted as a decomposition. So it's a lot of CO2. Like I said, it's in the background. We don't really notice it. Okay, so the core exequest idea. What are we trying to do here? We want to prevent biomass from decomposing and just minimize any additional CO2 emissions from anything else in the process. So that's, that's really the core of the idea. Okay, no more slides. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. But the, the core of the idea is that nature has done the work, right? why would you want to build like a huge factory with lots of complicated equipment to capture carbon when nature is just doing it around us all the time? And I think that's where the ExaQuest solutions come in. So there are really two ways to go about doing this. One is to keep the biomass dry and store it above ground. I'm trying to think of a good example. It would be like, uh, think of all the books on your bookshelf. If you allowed all the books on your bookshelf to get wet and to sit in the dirt, they would rot. It wouldn't happen immediately, but they would quickly rot, maybe within a few months. But if you keep your books on a bookshelf nice and dry, those books could last 100 years. So maybe we want to do something similar with biomass. And here, think of wood. Wood is probably the easiest form of biomass to work with. So you got logs and wood chips and all these forms of carbon that plants have captured. Is there a way we can put it in a container and keep it dry? There's another way of doing it, which I think is probably what will save us, putting the biomass underwater, under dirt on the bottom of a body of water. And you'd say, well, why would you want to do that? It's because that's the way nature formed the fossil fuels. Whether it's coal, oil, or natural gas, it all came from plant material that got buried underwater. Oh, sorry, quick question. You said you must not let it get wet in order for it to not decompose. But if you put it underwater, do you have to put it that, in a sealed container? Or? This is a really good point. Okay. If we're going to be like above ground, you want to keep it dry. But... We know that there are peat bogs and we know that fossil fuels came from plant material that got buried underwater. So you're right, water is not necessarily the enemy, but if you're going to have water in the system, you better bury it pretty deep and under a lot of water, under a lot of dirt. <laughs> so think of it as two extremes. One extreme is absolutely dry. The other extreme is the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, bottom of the yeah. ocean, submerged. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it, to me, it's an attractive idea of reversing the process that got us to the fossil fuels or replicating that process. I guess it, it can feel like a really big challenge. So nobody in the scientific world is really tackling this very seriously. Although I will say that there is a lot of interest right now in taking seaweed in the ocean and somehow sinking it to the bottom of the ocean. And it's just a variation of what I'm suggesting. Now, a lot of people probably ask, well, why don't you just bury it underground? And there are three reasons why you really wouldn't want to do that. The first is that you have to work really hard to create space underground. The density of wood chips is about 300 kilograms per meter cube. But now imagine that you need to store a billion tons. So <laughs> that's a lot of meters cubed, right? Now, if you're digging holes, you have to put in work to remove dirt and rocks for every meter cube that you want underground. So Jesus. to me, storing above ground is much smarter because you don't work for the extra space. The other thing is when you're underground, even with your best efforts, you will not keep water out. And water is a problem. So it's known that in landfills, water gets in, you got your garbage and water and, and decomposition happens but it's anaerobic decomposition, so it creates methane. So there's a lot of methane emissions from landfills, which are a real climate problem. Well, the exact same thing would happen if you took a bunch of wood chips or plant material and stuffed it underground and you couldn't keep the water out. Well, you would just have another methane emitting process. And then the third thing is that the soil is only so deep. So depending on where you are, it's only a few feet deep and then you hit rock. <laughs> so, so if you want to store a lot of material underground, you're going to be digging through a lot of rock. And if you want to avoid digging through rock, you're gonna be digging up a lot of soil. And that's a real problem because there's carbon stored in the soil 
for the same reasons we don't want farmers to be tilling their soil, you don't want to be digging it up for no reason. I guess what I'm interested in learning about is how do you plan to scale its solution? Because we're not just talking about storing one or two pieces of plywood. This is like billions and billions. This sounds like a massive global implementation plan that you've had in mind. So how are you going to scale this technology? Nobody can do it alone. In fact, ExaQuest is a nonprofit. So we just do research. Then we're going to publish the results of our research. We're going to show people that it's possible to store biomass in the way we're suggesting. It's going to be up to people to get excited about it. And I think we're in a really interesting moment with carbon capture and storage where everybody thinks they're going to get rich doing it. Yeah, I think ExaQuest, I think it's going to appeal to people in a way that is different. The way these other carbon capture businesses are doing their thing, they're going to say, we're a business, we're going to be like the Tesla or the Facebook of carbon capture. And when we succeed, we're going to make one guy rich. And I just don't feel like that resonates very well with people. You, you're going to want a solution that's more of a community involvement process. And that, to me, that's what ExaQuest is. Because if you think about where the biomass is, it's in the forests, it's in rural areas. It's also something that all of us have contact with all the time. So whether you have a little garden, if you're in the city, you might do a little bit of urban gardening, or if you're just an apartment dweller, you're dealing with cardboard and paper and all kinds of uh, stuff that can biodegrade part of. I think everybody is going to be around enough biomass where they say, hey, I've got a small yard where I rake the leaves every year and I trim my trees. That's, that must weigh three or 400 pounds. I could store that carbon. I think it's going to be a very different type of solution. And, and it's going to be about getting people excited about it. So how do you get it to scale? I think you have to show people that it works and then keep trying to persuade people that, that this is the way to do it. And unfortunately, I just have this feeling that we're going to be here 10 or 15 years from now and all these other technologies that we talked about will not have delivered meaningful reductions in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and people will be ready for new ideas. So I suspect that over the next 10 to 15 years, XQuest will be doing a lot of foundational experiments. We'll be doing things like your podcast where we try to reach a wide audience and explain the idea to people. And I think there's this bias in, among scientists against studying problems that are engineering problems. You know, what I've described, keep biomass dry or buried underwater, there's really nothing that complicated about it. It's really just an engineering challenge to say, how do we figure out how, how to do that at a huge scale without consuming very much energy. That, to scientists, that can seem very boring. They're like, oh, that's so obvious, I, I don't care. Let's just build a giant warehouse. Like there's nothing sexy about exactly. that idea. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're doing is extremely exciting. So right now you're at this proof of concept stage still, but eventually I'm picturing this decentralized network where you're getting communities, municipalities all involved. Right. How we're doing recycling in every city. Yeah, it would be, it would, I think it would work best in rural areas, right? Because rural areas are where the forests are and where the biomass is. The picture you should have in your mind is some kind of uh, rural community that's maybe like Alberta or Saskatchewan. It's like a bunch of forests and mountains. <laughs> um, right. Would be a good place for this. And that kind of community could, if this ends up being like profitable or a job creator, they will benefit from that. And to me, that would be a good thing. Um, right. There's wildfire management. Like, there are people who patrol the forest and do all this work already, so they might as well. Sometimes the greatest solutions are just right under your nose. And possibly. You know, yeah, yeah, we're and we're all going for these moonshot missions when we're ignoring yep. the obvious solution. So to summarize it for the listeners who may be a little bit confused, am I correct in assuming that because you're saying it's virtually impossible or very hard to reduce human cost emissions? why don't we instead try to reduce natural decomposition, which is another source of emissions? I think so. This is something that comes up when people talk about net zero. So why is there even the term net zero? Why, why not just go to zero emissions? Well, the, the truth is it's impossible to have zero human emissions. And so the idea behind every net zero pledge is that whatever small amount of CO2 emissions is still going to be around in 2050, we're going to balance it with uh, some amount of negative emissions or CO2 removal. And so this is just one of those technologies that can help us with CO2 removal. I think even if we just continue consuming like the way we do forever, I think ExaQuest could still solve the problem. You know what I mean? Like the carbon cycle is powerful enough to actually suck up enough carbon 
to allow us to survive on this planet, even if we're just bullheaded about it and we refuse to change anything. So there's no reason to be despondent. There's always something to work on. And, and there are lots and lots of people working on mitigation strategies, other carbon removal technologies. So I love the fact that I get to work on something that's kind of white space. It's like an open exactly. field. It's coming. No, I love it. Yeah, like the sky's the limit. You're the one. Yeah. <laughs> I will say ExaQuest is a nonprofit. So of course. we're going to do research. We might get a few patents, but it's all going to be open source. My greatest Amazing. wish is that somebody out there in your audience, in the world somewhere, will take what ExaQuest learns about biomass storage and say, that's awesome. And now I'm going to start a company. <laughs> oh, we just need this courageous businessman or businesswoman. Who's like that's living. right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that person exists. We have to lay out the roadmap for them so that they know they can. Really? Like I mean, that person might still be in college right now. And then when they listen to this podcast, they'll reach out to you. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I have hope in the next generation. I definitely do. Okay, John. So now getting to the most exciting part of the podcast, I really want you to share with my listeners your climate journey and your career trajectory and your life story, because we're all so interested in hearing what motivate you to pursue this climate mission. Yeah, yeah. It's, I guess you could say, a long, strange trip, right? I did not think that I would ever be in this position where I'm running my own nonprofit, where I'm targeting climate change as a key issue that I want to help solve. You know, I was growing up in high school in the 90s. Climate change was out there. People were talking about it. But it's very much like this will be a problem in 100 years or 200 years. And even as recently as, say, in the mid-90s or the year 2000, climate change was considered like a future problem. And so when I was at that age, my, my interests were more in, let's say, foreign affairs or diplomacy. There were things happening like the euro was becoming a currency in Europe. Or there were Arabs and Israelis were negotiating peace. Or there was fun stuff happening internationally. So I was like, I'd like to be part of that. Maybe I'll be a diplomat. But you know, I was in law school and all of a sudden, George Bush, who's president, and he gets us into a war in Iraq and we have 9-11 happen. And, and before I graduated from law school, where I looked around at the world and I was like, I'm seeing a lot less optimism about our ability to work together as countries. Not to say that we can't live together as citizens of the world, but the governments don't seem to want to cooperate with right. each other anymore. So I was like, maybe diplomacy is not the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I've put a lot of effort into this legal education. So I was like, all right, let me do what most law students do. So I clerked for a federal judge in Philadelphia. I got married. And my wife was living in New York. So I was like, okay, and when I finish my clerkship, I'll move to New York. I'll work for a law firm. Eh. <laughs> Probably aren't many of your listeners who have worked in a corporate law firm, but it's, it's nothing like it is on TV. It ain't fun. <laughs> Nobody looks good. It's so sad. Like after two or three years at a law firm, you get these people who come in, they're looking great. They're just- What about you know, Obama and Michelle? They met a law firm. But they left pretty quickly. Like, oh, that is very <laughs> true. That is very true. <laughs> yeah. They left before the job ground them down. So anyways, I did- I I spent a couple of years doing that and I was like, okay, this is certainly well paid, but it's not really what I enjoy doing so much. You know, that was when the financial crisis hit, there was a huge oil price spike, the climate change kept growing and growing as an issue. And I said, I think I'm ready for a switch. I'm going to take a jump and, and educate myself and figure out how I can contribute to solving this problem. And so to me, that just meant I'd have to re-educate myself. And I, I also wanted a chance to be a scientist. And if you want a chance to be a scientist, you need to have the right credentials. I, I was able to find a school that lets you do a second bachelor's degree, which was the City College of New York. And you would say, oh, if you're in New York City, why don't you go to Columbia? Well, yeah. the truth is Columbia will not admit you for a second bachelor's degree. Oh. It's really only the community colleges who allow this. So the City College of New York is part of the City University of New York. It's like a community college. But it had like a engineering school with chemical engineering. So I was like, mm -hmm. how lucky can I get? And then the subway ride was pretty easy. So, Oh, you know. yeah. Everything lined up. I was able to go there, get my degree, and then my grades were good. So I was like, okay, like, where can I go next? And I applied for all these PhD programs in chemical engineering. And I was admitted to Caltech and MIT and Stanford wow. and all the other. I decided, hey, I'll go to Stanford. I'll try to work for this professor. And so I went for it. I, I, I got there. I got into the research group I wanted to, to be in. And then what really spurred me to look hard at climate change again was the wildfires in paradise and the emergence of Greta Thunberg. So this was like late 2018. I'm in the sort of doing my PhD work, but I'm starting to get a little disillusioned with it. I've got my family. My daughter was about a year old at the time. And so I was beginning to feel this like push and pull of time commitments. And I was like, if I really want to commit to this scientific research, I should really be sure about it. Yeah. And I started having my doubts. I just, it, it became clear to me that the problem was bigger than I had ever understood. And again, that's a really strange thing to say as somebody who's been following climate change for years. 
there are like levels uh, of your understanding of the problem. There's a sort of like a general awareness that it's a problem, but then it, it does take a while before you understand like where we are exactly in terms of solving it. And about 2018, I said, I don't think we're getting very close to solving this. <laughs> so, so we need something else. And then I go ahead and read that National Academies report, I educate myself about these carbon removal technologies. And I say, maybe there's a better way of doing this. And I looked at the carbon cycle and I was like, why do we just let wood chips rot? It seems really easy to store wood. Like, why doesn't anybody try to do this? So I guess I've, I've been very blessed to be in an environment at Stanford where I was getting paid to be a grad student. Very few people ever have a chance to really sit and think about a problem the way I was able to sit and think about climate change and carbon removal. And the ExaQuest is a result of that process. Amazing. Wow. I was trying to think of some advice I would give to your listeners. Yes, please. We would love to hear yeah. what kind of advice do you have for people who are maybe college students or people in their 20s or even 30s. They want to do something about climate change, but they don't know what's out there for them. Yeah, I would say the first thing is to learn about it. So educate yourself, learn what you can. And if you start having ideas that are different from what you're hearing everybody else talking about, that's probably a good thing. Don't be afraid of it. It's you're probably onto something because we need new ideas. And it can be frustrating if you've got a new idea, but you're not the world's expert in something. Maybe people don't listen to you. But the good thing about a problem like climate change is that the results matter, like data talks. The real world will have its influence on these things. So if you got an idea, you want to try it out, go ahead and do something. And people will judge for themselves whether it's making a difference or not. Yeah, it, that's exactly where ExaQuest is right now, because I've presented this idea to many audiences of scientists and they shrug their shoulders and they're like, none of my friends in this room thinks this is an awesome idea. So you must be wrong. Like you're Mr. John Lynn. I've never heard of you. Like where's your medal of engineering or something? That is well true. People will only <laughs> affirm something is valid unless it has been previously validated by other experts. It's like true. a group mentality. It is. And the problem is intensifying faster than anybody thought was possible before. And I think it's a way to manage the anxiety, honestly. Be part of the solution. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem, right? So, so true. If you, yeah. And if you make yourself part of the solution, then you sleep very well at night. You're doing the best you can. Now, look, I'm super lucky because I don't need to hold down a full-time job while I'm trying to do this at the same time. If you have to make money to you know, pay the bills, then that's just life. But there are lots of ways to get involved in, in small ways. Yeah. And wow. Be brave, I guess. I love it. I, I love it. And you embody that philosophy in what you do. Because I agree, ultimately, climate change is an interdisciplinary problem. So we're going to need a pluralism of ideas in order to tackle yep. this from every single aspect we can think of. The science and engineering aspect is a huge aspect, but I do think we need to make changes to our behaviors and lifestyles. Like flying less, beating plants. And these are not scientific solutions. It's just obvious stuff. So, and, and it's more of a social thing. I think it's, it's a lot to ask of a person to be some kind of you know, superhero or just to, to live in anything other than a normal life. So the more we can make these climate solutions part of normal life, I think we'll make more progress that way. You've taught us so much about carbon capture and storage and also what you're doing in ExaQuest and your personal journey. And this has all been extremely fascinating. So now listeners are probably wondering, John is such a cool human being. I want to get in touch with him and work on ExaQuest. So how can they reach you? So the website is www.exaquest.org. And the way you spell exaquest, E-X-A-Quest.org. You can reach me at john.lin at exaquest.org. So J-O-H-N dot L-I-N at exaquest.org. And then you can follow us on social media. So our website has all of our social media links. So we're on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. Thank you so much, John, for sharing with us your story and, and teaching us so much about climate-related technologies. Yeah. Thanks so much um, for having me on today. This was a lot of fun. No, thank you so much. And now I have to take some time to digest everything. And I'm sure the listeners will too. But yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in today to Make Peace Not Beef. And please reach out to John. He's working on some really cool and exciting things with ExaQuest. And I can't wait to see where the future will take you and your company. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Mm -hmm.